Eric here. I'm George Ura. I'm the Director of Academic Technology at the School of Nursing. And uh, my team and I work with faculty to help um, setting up courses and sometimes setting up online courses, sometimes uh, working in clinical labs, and sometimes working in academic classrooms. So the way this evolved is um, the School of Nursing is a brand new building. So two years ago, we went to all active learning classrooms. There is still one auditorium lecture hall, but we don't use it to teach. So it's a really different format to, um, to teach, to delivering. And George approached me and said, I saw this great piece around design thinking. Do you want to try it in your classroom? Um, and so I was getting by. I don't know what we did. said, yes, let's, let's give it a shot. So do you want to explain where you started? Sure. So I was actually reading a book, which is called Creative Confidence. I have to be honest, I, I wasn't reading the book, I was listening to the book. I commute on the bus, and so I have audible accounts and I usually listen to something, and sometimes some really useful, neat ideas uh, arrive to me that way. So Creative Confidence is by the Kelly Brothers. They're the founders of a company called IDEO, which is a company that works with all kinds of big firms that you've heard about, from Google to everything else, and um, they, they design uh, creative new products. Um, and so they developed this process, really design thinking, and now they uh, work at the Design for D school at Stanford and teach courses for Stanford students on design thinking, so it comes from the source. But what the book mentioned um, a guy who was named as Doug Dietz, and I think rather than tell you what design thinking is in abstract terms, it's the best way to approach it. If you are not very familiar with it, that's probably, an example is probably the best way to go. So. Um, there's a wonderful TED talk. Um, I encourage you to take, take a peek. Doug Dietz talking about his experience with design thinking. So this is what happened. Doug Dietz is an engineer working for GE Medical Division, and he was one of the um, team leads and co-designer of the newest CAT scan machine that GE was very proud of. Millions and millions of dollars spent on research and building this machine. And then finally, it was ready to go. He was on the hospital floor. He decided to go to one of the first hospitals that had it and actually uh, see how patients use it to kind of experience his triumph after years of work. So there he was and, and waiting for the patients to arrive. And there was uh, this tiny uh, girl that came with parents. The girl was just sobbing and the parents were close to crying and saying, honey, we can get through this, don't worry about it, and so on. And he had this uh, eureka moment when he realized that, uh, this is him talking, that actually, he saw it as an engineer, he was proud of it, it's a great product, but it's scary, and from the kid's point of view, it's actually totally different. It's not the same thing for him, and for the kid, and for the parents. And so he then did some research, and found out that about 80% of kids who get a CAT scan have to be sedated, sedated, and they're so scared. The machine makes a really loud sound, thumping sound, as you go through. And so um, about 20% or 30% of appointments have to be canceled and rescheduled mm -hmm. there with pediatric patients. And so he was really devastated. He knew he could not just go and redesign a machine that's too expensive and a big project. So he thought about it. He talked to parents, he talked to people at GE. And then he came up with this idea um, that kind of is the example of how you discover there's a different point of view, discover that someone sees things differently, explore how they see it, and think about how you could address the problem. So what he did was brilliant and simple and wonderful. He actually worked with several teams, and they converted the GE um, scan, um, CAT scan machines into entertainment centers. So they have several themes. This is um, one of them is the Pirate Co., one of them is the Interstellar Ship, and they actually created the whole educational experience for kids, so they have puppets, they have toys, they tell them you're going to be in a spaceship, and it's going to make this thumping sound when it goes to hyperdrive and so on. And so basically, without really changing the machine, he came up with the idea of how it can work better. Uh, and I think that's a perfect example. We have more examples. Now they have five or six models. You know, there's Pirate Co., there's Interstellar Ship, and, and many other choices which really works. Kids, kids are kind of looking forward to it, you can look forward to it, but they're not scared, they're just kind of experiencing it in a totally different way. So this, this was something that, that I thought um, maybe we could use, and, and uh, Pam was uh, enthusiastic about this, and we had worked together before, so she's my go to one of my several go to people at the school of nursing, right, one of kind of the gen idea, I know what she's going to think. It must be the way to That's right. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, it was it was fun because when we talked to students about it, 
um, in class, um, one of our students uh, said, actually, I know about bees. And oh. it turned out that he's from Milwaukee, and she was from Milwaukee, and he was um, our soccer coach. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a personal connection with So uh, more formal approach to it. We have, uh, first, you have to have a challenge, something that you realize is a problem. Uh, then you kind of have to realize that different people see it differently. And that is the difficult part because it's hard to step outside of yourself and see it through the eyes of another person. But that's part of design thinking, figuring out how you can see how others see the same problem. And then you actually collect data, come up with an idea how you can address or minimize or fix the problem. Then you experiment, and that's a very important thing that you actually make something. You create a prototype of something that allows you to address and fix the problem. And then you test it, you refine it, and you go at it again until it works in a way that is satisfactory. So basically, realizing the problem, trying to see it through the eyes of somebody else or other groups um, that you may not be familiar with, then uh, trying to <coughs> to fix the problem, creating a prototype of something that will fix it, and going through iterations of different things until you're satisfied with the outcome is the process of design thinking. And when we talked about it for the first time, Pam said, um, I was so not impressed. I was like, well, that's the nursing process, <laughs> which had different words. And my guess is no matter what your field is, you have a process that's similar to that. And so we have more formal terms than nursing. They essentially mean the same thing, but you assess. Um, then you interpret, and you do that collaboratively now. We're there in the patient-centered care and health care now, so you don't just decide what's wrong with a patient. You talk to the patient about your problem list, what I see, how you see it, and how you prioritize those things. And then you make a plan for how you're going to address that, and then the evaluation is again joint. Did it work? How are things going? So we, I banished the language in my classroom around non-compliant patient, bad patient, you know, I said nobody ever grew up and said I want to be able to stay that way. There's a reason why things don't work. So I've been, I teach public health, and so I've, I've been having that conversation along the way. So the, when this landed, I thought, ah, oh, this is a great way to start getting at, they were using words around non-compliance and diabetes, and I was like, we're not talking like that anymore. So that's how we applied it to the subject of diabetes, but the process lined up beautifully. So we met in Daisy Cafe, the home of cupcakes, where you shouldn't go if you're talking about diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> and drew this out. And so really, I said these line up. So you'll see the first column on the left is the nursing process. The column on the, in the middle is design thinking. And then we said, what could we do that would stimulate those things? Part of the pro or part of our challenge, I would say, the problem is I teach public health, so I try to cram a whole bunch of stuff into 16 weeks. And so I really didn't want this, you can do a semester of design thinking. And so I didn't want it to take more than two class periods. So this is our brain room now, right? So that was a big challenge because um, Pam said, that's great, two hours. Um, and I thought, really? Uh, one of our faculty actually proposed a course on design thinking, and that's like 15 weeks, uh, two hours. So <laughs> we decided that we are going to take shortcuts. And that was a good thing because I think that actually makes it usable. So the idea really was, uh, these are our actual notes from the day of meeting, but as you can figure out. Uh, but the idea really was that in two hours, we would introduce students to the concept of design thinking. We wanted to make sure they know enough about it, so then later in life, when they work in healthcare, they can actually use the process. It was not about actually going through the whole process, although we tried to get as close as we could, but it was about giving them enough information so they would understand how it works, uh, be convinced that it actually works, and experience it so they could go back to it as a method in their actual practice. So um, we had a challenge. As you remember, the first step is challenge. So to find a complex problem that needs to be solved. And um, the question we ask is, do I understand the problem? And what is it all about? Now, by the way, this is uh, one of our active learning classrooms. I don't know if you are familiar with the School of Nursing. Um, this is the room that we do this in, 152 seats. Um, round tables of um, nine students, we have 17 tables. But the truth is, you can do it in any room where you have chairs that are movable, and frankly, if you really, really had to, you can do it in a lecture hall um, if students can kind of huddle together and, and work in groups of three. So this is very convenient, but it doesn't have to be. 
actual room, special room for that. You can do it pretty much. And you could do this over a semester if you really wanted to. You could spread it out. So we threw in little questions along the way that, you know, as a nursing instructor, I really wanted to encourage critical thinking along the way. So don't just give me rote answers, but now, do I really fully understand? So I, I have those little checkpoints in here. Like, do I understand is that there's somewhere else I should look for information? So we decided to take a shortcut to how do you show students that there is more than one point of view? Well, conveniently, um, we found uh, a bunch of articles about um, monitoring, self-monitoring of blood glucose um, in diabetic patients. And uh, there is a series of articles published by the ADA and American Diabetes Association that are called Point Counterpoint. These are very convenient, because usually they have a specialist who presents one point of view that something is good and should be done in clinical practice. And another one who says, usually, that's a waste of money. Let's not do it. Hospitals can save money. They don't do it. And that was exactly the case. So we have two articles, self-monitoring of blood glucose um, in non-insulin using type 2 diabetic patients. One is for and one is <coughs> against. And uh, we approached this as a jigsaw puzzle exercise. We wanted students to actually identify with the point of view. So the idea really was that um, we divided students into two groups, and half of the class read Article 8 in favor, half of the class read against, and then they had to sit together in a jigsaw activity. They had to fill in the other person on the arguments. Now, uh, to make sure that they have done it, this is the cardinal rule of active learning classroom. You have to make sure that they have done the homework, otherwise it won't work. So we had a multiple choice quiz that they had to complete before coming to class to check that they had read their own article. Now, I, I, we need to give credit to Morton M. Gernsbacher, who was a presenter at this forum last year, and um, she actually has this wonderful idea um, she teaches a very large undergraduate online course, and she um, wants students to read relatively advanced articles. They're all undergrad. And so she came up with the idea, or at least she shared it with the, um, with the faculty and staff here, that you can actually highlight things in articles in PDF, and then you can also black them out, like uh, kind of secret, I don't know, CIA things that have things blacked out. Uh, so that's what she does, and we use that same method. So we highlight it. These are fairly complex articles. Uh, these are undergrads, and so we highlighted things that were important. We also, I didn't, uh, we don't have a, a visual of this, but we have in parts that are focused on methods, statistical methods. We actually cover that with a dark, dark navy thing, and students can remove this if they want to, but they know very clearly they don't have to. Which made me roll in my grade. You know, I was like, no, I want them to read research, but. I will say this was successful because it was so accessible to them, and so you know, they could do it, that they actually did. Um, so it depends on what you're teaching at that point. If you're teaching them how to read research, that probably isn't how I would go about it, but for our context, it worked really well. That video of Morton is online at the AF Teaching Academy webpage, so go see that if you weren't able to come. It's a great idea, so we're, we're grateful for, for that. Um, so once they knew, we ask, uh, we ask, how would you find out more about this? So now you know there is a different point of view. Now you know that some patients don't test their blood glucose uh, or their blood sugar. And how would you find out why they don't? What would you do? And so uh, we substituted a class on health literacy and communication with patients. And I'm always telling them, if you put a patient back on their heel, if you say, why don't you check your blood sugar? Uh, I, and I use the example, I approach one, get really close and go, why didn't you do the readings? And then I say, how do you feel when I do that? And I said, just look at it. What makes it hard to do the readings? What got in the way? Just language that gives people a window to draw out of makes all the difference. So I make them think about that and also use, um, instead of, you know, why aren't you doing daily glucometry, you know, how do you really talk to patients about checking your sugar? So there were some pieces in here about just, um, health literacy, common language, and ways to approach and interact with people that don't make them defensive or make them feel like bad patients. Um, and often would get a more honest answer. Um, so instead of my dog ate my homework, you might get what actually happened. So, so they had to come up with a survey. That, so from the articles they read and from what they understood, I was asking them to synthesize half nursing content. What do you suppose? are the things that get in the way. So if you have a Likert scale survey, you could ask. So I was really looking to see how much they understood about the problem and how creative they were in their language. So that was the end of the first day. 
they had posed the question, <coughs> he got to that point, and then um, George had found a beautiful article that he reposted that they could get into the next day. So when, when we asked them to plan or envision the survey, we gave them very specific parameters. We wanted them to have a specific number of questions on the survey. They had to be in a specific format. Uh, we asked them to use a library or liquor scale, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, and it had to be a scale from one to six. And then for each one of those questions they would like to ask, they also had to predict what they thought the number would be for a large sample of patients. So they had questions, and they also had their rankings, like one group thought that uh, the cost would be an important issue. So um, very important uh, or not important, and they would give it a number. So once they had that, we took a big shortcut, because normally you could go for a couple of weeks collecting data. Now I said conveniently, we actually did have data. So once they didn't know that really, they didn't <laughs> read that article obviously, we didn't want them to, it was hidden, uh, it was not available to them. But once they had their project for a survey, we said, okay, there is actually a survey. It uses the same type of questions, the same format, the same library scale. Would you work in groups and compare your planned survey with the actual survey? Did you match, do some of the questions that you wanted to ask overlap with the questions that were asked? Were there some bad questions you didn't think should be asked? Were there some good questions on your list that the researchers actually could have asked and didn't? And how do those numbers compare? Did you anticipate the right things? Mm -hmm. Or did you think it was the cost, but in fact it was something else? So they took a little bit of time uh, reading, and they had to read it for the second day, not the yes. first, for the second day. And they then they worked in groups comparing their survey and their predictions with the actual results. And so then we asked them to go into that ideation phase. Where, what would you design now that you understand the different perspectives on the problem and you've seen what some research has shown really are the obstacles? Now, what could you design that might get at some of those barriers? Um, and we were skewed a little bit. Can I share here where we were skewed? Sure. I teach two classes in that senior class, and the first one in the morning had been on apps in healthcare. So that's immediately where they went. Everyone had an app to fix this, but it had just been, um, I hadn't thought that through how those two would overlap, but I could see it. So they talked about technology and healthcare is really how the test has been framed up. So almost every design was an app for that. Um, but one of the things nurses, and I don't know if this is true of other fields, um, we're really good at planning and getting excited. We're not great about setting up what our evaluation parameters would be. We don't really like that phase of the whole thing. So I always ask them, how will you know it worked? What will be the measures you look at? You know, what defines the problem so then what makes it better? And so I asked along the way, how will you? So not only design this, but then tell me what would you watch to see if this is a good thing or not. And I think this is, a, this is partly a, a caveat or, or moment to avoid a trap. It's very easy at this point to make it into a fun activity where everybody jumps around and moves and does stuff and nothing comes out of it. Um, and they will enjoy it and you will enjoy it. It will take time and then you will think, what did they learn? So there is a very simple way to tr at least try to fix it, prevent it, and that is we ask them to address one specific problem from the survey. They had to commit to addressing just one, not everything, not improve it for patients overall. Just pick one of the problems preferably one of the important ones that came with a high number on the survey, and then your team has to come up with something that addresses this one specific problem. And then number two, it had to be something that you would make, and it had to be reasonably feasible. So in other words, you could not say, okay, the important problem was it's too expensive. Let's have the company make it cheaper. Well, you can't do that. <laughs> what could you do to make it address other problems? So it had to be feasible, it had to address one thing, and uh, they had to actually physically produce something. So they developed a patient aid. Um, they went for the apps. And these were theoretical. So our, we have the luxury of having a really wired classroom. Everyone has their own flat screen. Um, all the computers are plugged in. And so they were posting. That, and they used different formats. I mean, some put it up in PowerPoint. Others were drawing on the whiteboards. But for the most part, every table um, had access so many of them did kind of really a wireframe of an app on the phone and how it would collect the data and how patients could actually <coughs> enter the data. They had the kind of flow charts and stuff and um, it, it was actually pretty neat, although it was heavily skewed towards high tech stuff. We have a way. So then we had students, we just run 17 tables, there are about 15 full in that classroom. So we had enough time for them to share. Um, here's what we thought of and these are the measures we would use to, to show whether it worked and then there was some banter back and forth. It, 
it, it was quite strict. I don't remember exactly, but I think it was three minutes per I, table. That's what I, we I, did. I, when we were timing it, so they had to move on. They had just a few minutes to do that. And um, then, again, you know, it could stay there. We wanted them to know that the exercise they went through, taking the survey and actually collecting, looking at the data and addressing one problem, was something that Roche, which is one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies, actually did exactly the same way. And we wanted them to know what the big company came up with. And they were somewhat shocked because what the big company came up with was a printable chart that patients would fill. It was not a high-tech app. And it was not a phone thing. Uh, so they were surprised. But actually, this does address at least one of the major problems. And we wanted students to know that this is a real way to approach problems. The big companies use this method of design thinking to actually solve big problems. And then they realized that one of the authors was one of the first authors in the for against. He was also the co-author of the survey. And he is the author of the actual thing that the Roche company produced for um, AccuCheck brand, which is a popular um, self-monitoring brand on the market. So they could compare and see that it's real. It's not just an activity for the class. And this actually afforded a teachable moment. I hadn't thought it. As they were coming up with their staff for that, and I was thinking, this is your grandpa you're talking about. So some grandpas are quite happy, but others are not. Or their fingers, especially with patients with diabetes, that aren't nimble enough to do some of the things they expected. So mm -hmm. it was nice to go back and say, you've got to also think not just about the problem and the data, but who are the real people that are your end users. So it was, it sort of, you know, I kind of went into it like, okay, we'll try it. But for, a, for this purpose, it was really um, Did the students come up with any better ideas than Roche? I really liked some of their ideas. I mean, I, they had little alarms that would go off when it was time to check your blood sugar, which I'm sure exists now, but it's part of a, it was an application where you wouldn't have to set your phone. You could actually just plug in this whole piece. And then some uploaded right to the clinic. A lot of times, as a practitioner, what you see is people go, oh, yeah, I've been checking, but I forgot to bring it. Or um, in the middle of a really busy clinic visit, you get handed this ring. So <laughs> you know you just can eyeball it, but that's about it. So the idea of uploading in real time into the electronic health record was sort of beautiful because if you were monitoring a patient over time, you could say, hey, let's pop it in. The sugars are up pretty high. Um, so they did come up with some questions. So, so the students, they saw that first step, uh, or the second step of interpreting and recognizing the users, they didn't only think of the users of the people who were checking their sugar, but they were also thinking of, what if, what's it going to be like for me in the yeah. clinic when I have to right. deal with that? And one of the barriers that was <coughs> Surveys patients would say, I do it, and nobody cares. Nobody reads it because they get that sense. You know, if a practitioner has time, they do it. They don't. They don't. And it was one of the biggest surprises because when students were anticipating the result, they went for the obvious thing, uh, such as the price. And then it turned out the price is a factor, but it's not the highest one. The worst thing, the highest thing on the list of reasons why people do not monitor the blood, blood glucose is they do initially, and then they bring it with them to their appointment, and no one looks at it or does anything with it. And then they think like, well, it's kind of expensive. It's kind of consuming. It hurts. All of these are problems that are listed, but not top problem. And then if no one's going to do anything about it, I'm just not going to And I don't get positive feedback one way or the other, so. So they were looking at different points of view. You know, from the point of view of a patient, it hurts and it's expensive. Uh, but then again, from the point of view of why does a patient not want to do it, that's because the healthcare practitioner uh, doesn't incorporate it into the visit or doesn't come up with a plan how it could be used. And in fact, uh, if we go back, the, uh, the Roche worksheets, actually, there are two of them. They uh, are very simple. They have another one in which patients are, are encouraged to actually uh, write down what they eat and then write down their sugars. And the question at the end is, how does this specific food affect your blood glucose? And so people learn that way. So you don't really have to have a healthcare practitioner. You can clearly see if I eat that, it won't really come up. <laughs> I shouldn't eat that. So it's a very simple thing. But as a practitioner, if somebody handed me that, I could eyeball the whole month in one graph. You know, I could be like, oh, there's where you spike a couple days. Or this is how often. This is in general how they run without having to spend a lot of time. So it's actually, this is actually a good format for both. Did the students like, like the process? Or did they? They did. You know, some, so detectives, I don't know how many of you tried active learning, but I shared with you, it's a little like- if I thought about me. Yes, 
Oh, yeah, I got pissed at when I brought out the bird board one day, like, we're going to do concept maps. And they literally went, <laughs> because they do that so much. Um, so they smell it on you if it's artificial. Um, and sometimes it feels like planning activities for a six-year-old's birthday party, you know, like, yeah, you can do, 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 do. And I've learned, I've learned that I have to make things really authentic and meaningful, and it doesn't have to be busy, 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 but it does need to be interactive and have meaning for them. And just like this, I've got to give them feedback that has meaning. Um, they, if they just tough in assignments and they get points for being present only and engaged, and you don't give them feedback on what they produced, they, they will, I'll mute you again. I, I get the quality goes way down. So I'm writing another version of this now to go around childhood vaccinations because it's such a hot topic and there are so many different points of view 